like to say a couple things about Dr. Philip Lee Miller. So he is an MD. Uh, he's the founder and medical director and CEO of California Age Management Institute, which is formerly known as the Los Gatos Longevity Institute. He's been in medical practice for over 46 years. Graduated from University of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, with a centennial class of 1968 with a degree in biochemistry. In 1972, he graduated from UC San Diego of Medicine, School of Medicine, in the charter class with an MD degree. He has further training in neurology at UC Davis. He has been ABEM board certified in emergency and is currently uh, ABAARM. Okay, you're going to have to tell me what that is. Scre yell it out. American Board of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. Thank you. Okay. All right. So he's been uh, uh, long been an internationally recognized leader in anti-aging, longevity, and integrative medicine. And with gratitude, this started with an early association with Dr. Julian Whitaker of the Whitaker Wellness Institute in Newport Beach, California. Um, I would like to uh, introduce him then actually by reading the last couple. So, this is a newsletter that we publish. Uh, you can get it online at svhi, Silicon Valley Health Institute.com. And uh, there's information, past uh, newsletters are on there also. And you also have uh, all the videos from about uh, 20 years' history of us doing presentations here. Okay? So, just really in reading the summation, this is actually a uh, uh, about his presentation, his talk. So uh, he will be presenting a unified theory and vision of the age regression and regenerative therapies. How can we now think about living to 120 or more? What are the challenges? And he says, you can start by reading the weekly blog by Reason called Fighting, or sorry, fightantiaging.org. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Miller to come up with us. Please welcome Dr. Miller. Can you hear me okay? I want to thank Susan and the steering committee and everybody who's responsible for inviting me again. And the last time I was here, I said, uh, I feel like, you know, on Saturday Night Live when they say I'm the member of the fifth uh, presentation, I think I've been here at least five or six times. I go back as far as Steve. I think Steve and I are probably some of the originals. So I want to thank you again. Um, I'm looking forward to it giving you a really interesting overview of where we've been in anti-aging medicine in the last 25 years and what I see is going on in the next oh, 15 or 20 years because what I'm seeing is we've, we've consolidated what anti-aging and longevity medicine is all about, but we're, on the, we're really on the verge of a whole new explosion of therapies and ways of thinking about aging. Um, I think one of the really um, in, enthusiastic and really heartening developments that I see is that there's always been a, a disconnect between what we call town and gown. The, town, the gown being researchers, university professors, and the, and the town being guys like me who are just practitioners. And they've always been seen as sort of that loggerheads because one group is very erudite and the other group are just a bunch of guys or women. But what I'm seeing now, I think just in the last couple of years, there seems to be a convergence and there's, there is more and more aging research that's gone beyond just biogerontology that's being done at some really major universities, uh, a lot of work being done at uh, Mayo Clinic, then work being done at the Buck Institute. So what I'm going to try to show you is I'm going to quickly go through a presentation that I've been doing for the last 25 years. So some of this is going to be a little old, but I want you to see what was old, what were our predictions, how good were we, and then where are we going now. So let's kind of dive into this. This was from uh, Ken Dickwald. He's really, really an amazing guy. This was written about 1987. In 1987, he said, in the coming years, American culture will shift from being focused on youth to be increasingly concerned with the needs, problems, dreams, of a middle-aged and older population. 
The coming age wave will challenge and shake every aspect of our personal, social, political dynamics. How we will alter ourselves in response will be an issue of mounting concern. Indeed, it may prove to be the single most controversial issue in the twilight of this century. Now, this is 1987. Um, again, 1993, health facilities will be pushed to the limits. So at that time, we were looking at 76 million baby boomers, boomers turning 50 at the rate of one every 18 seconds, always been on the leading edge, account for the greatest demographic bulge. That's certainly true in Japan, and I think it's going to be true here in the, in the first world. You're going to see this bulge of people our age. Redefining aging, treatable condition, and what I call the El Dorado or Shangri-La complex. So what is age management? People ask me, what do I do? And I said, well, it depends on what you want me to tell you. Because everybody has an, a concept of what I do and what I'm all about and what, what my goal is. My goal really is to make you better. Because it's either the functional, high-tech preventive medicine, integrative, holistic, nutritional, it's not pathology or disease-based, which is the big disconnect here. It's proactive, prolonging health span, and now what I'm going to talk to you about is regenerative. So aging is a treatable condition. It's about adding life to your years, not years to your life. It's growing older without aging. It's about quality of life without limits. It's attitude. I love this one. This guy, I think, is 80. It's about vigor, also 80. Look at this guy. So it's about, you know, what, what, what can we achieve? What can women achieve? What can guys can achieve? And it's about playfulness. This is one of my favorites. This is when Jacqueline was 81. That was his wife. And it's about a new paradigm. And at that time, John Glenn had just gone into space the second time, you know, at the age of, I think it was about 80. And look at his eyes. The motivation, look at that, look at the vigor in his eyes. So what is the goal? Forever young? We're going to talk about what does that mean. You see some of my favorite quotes, U.B. Blake, when U.B. Blake was a great jazz pianist, when he turned 100, he said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. The trick to being this is another good. The trick to live to be 100 is very few people die after 100. <laughs> and my favorite is, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I don't want to achieve immortality by not dying. I don't want to live in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live in my apartment. That's Woody Allen. So these were some classic um, attributes and what we thought of as in terms of classic beauty, in terms of classic health, in terms of classic youthfulness. Um, who's this? Marlene Dietrich. Who's this? Isn't it amazing that she is still considered an icon all these years later? Um, my friend Suzanne Summers. Look at how, look, how good she looks. Look at how good she looks. This is when she, I think she was at least 75. I think she's probably 85 now. So one of the things that I tell women is for the first time in history, and I mean history, women now, it used to be, I, like I remember my grandmother, my grandmother was 50, you're old. You dressed old, you looked old, because you're going to die. <laughs> it's not true now, because now we see these icons, you know, what can women look like? This is when Suzanne was probably about 68 or 70. This is when she was about 70. This is when she was about 75. And... Um, he lives just around the corner from me. And this is my favorite. Uh, Betty White. I think Betty White just turned 97. <laughs> so, and this is again my favorite. This is Jack. I love this quote. I can't die, it would ruin my image. So these were, these were images that we had of youthfulness and playfulness. And how could we achieve that? What are the things that we could get to? What are our models? What can we look forward to? So there were demographic changes. Again, this is what we were looking at like in the 90s and the 2000s. This was this demographic change here. You can see life expectancy going up to 1985, and it kept going. I think it's leveled off for a little while here. That's our challenge right now. It's gone down since 
I don't know that it's 2001. I think it's gone down the last three or four years. 2018. I think it's 2000. We can argue about this. The reality is, the question is, why is it going down? Whether, I don't care whether it's two years, three years, four years, or five years, the question is why it's going down. And I have some answers for that. Then we have a history of aging. The idea is this, what I call the squaring of the curve, where you're, you're a, a very long health span as opposed to lifespan. This is a growth of population over 65. This is it. And the population over 85 is even more. So the, the, the fastest growing segment of our population is 65 and 85 year olds. This was Social Security, and this was Medicare, this was the strain of Medicare. This is actually still operative, which is as we get older, there are fewer and fewer younger people who are supporting all of us. And what are we going to do about that? And this was the strain in Medicare. So this is what I had been talking about for the last few years in terms of all the debate on health care so far has all been about money. It's not been about health care. It's been about what I call shifting, cost shifting, or basically here's the HMO formula, which is capitation times lives equals revenue. And what falls out of that? Quality. And if any of you have gone to Kaiser or Sutter, you may have experienced this. So our choices were integrative medicine, anti-aging medicine, functional restoration, and then I'm going to talk to you about regenerative therapies. So the paradigm shift is, what is the goal? This is the goal. Goal is balance. And I'm going to tell you what that means. It's balance in all aspects. Balance. It's something I've talked about for years, hormone balancing, balancing your life, balancing left brain, right brain. What is this all about? How do we achieve this balance? So we look at, there's anabolic and catabolic. There's osteoblast and osteoclast. The bone is always being reformed. It's being, the old bone is being broken down, new bone is being reformed. Old bones, so our bones theoretically are not the same as they were five years ago. Estrogen, progesterone balance each other off. P53 and telomerase, this one's really, to me, this is like a real seminal concept. P53 is a tumor suppressor, and telomerase, I'm going to talk to you about more. Telomerase is what actually increases cellular division. Calcium, magnesium, and it's kind of like all, the balance can be seen as, a, as a, an analogy to a car. So in the car, you have your brakes, and you have the accelerator. And what I think of is, as we get older, what's happening is our brakes are beginning to wear out. They're not working as well. And the accelerator is still kind of working, working better than the brakes. And if you're going down a hill, and you step on the gas, and you crash, you didn't crash because you stepped on the accelerator. You probably crashed because your brakes weren't working. This actually happened to my dad, I think, in the 30s. So what's happening with age? What's happening to us? We're losing power. We're losing energy, maybe libido, maybe memory, motivation. Really important when kinesthetic sense, just balance. What are we doing just about balance? You know that commercial where you see, help, help, I'm falling, I can't get up, I'm in the park which leads to locomotion and autonomy. And one thing that people don't talk about is money. What do we do with, what if we're 80 or 90 or 100? What are our funds? So this is an interesting chart, because what I tried to think about is, you know, I remember when I was at Berkeley and I took uh, um, Chem 5, which is thermodynamics, which I never fully understood. And every time I try to review it, I still can't understand it. But basically, it comes down to, in the 19th century, people tried to begin to actually quantify and try to understand what was energy. So they came up with Gibbs free energy and Helmholtz free energy. But we had known from Newton that there was power, and they were sort of Newtonian forces. So in some ways, it's easier to think of we're losing power more than we're losing energy. And work is related to power. So these are kind of concepts that are, that are interesting physical forces in terms of what are we losing, what are we trying to gain back. So work is, 
is basically force through distance, and energy is, is the ability to work, and power is just a matter of how much work can you do in a, per, in a period of time. So again, I, in, when we talk about losing energy, it may actually be better to say we're losing power, and that could be mental power, physical power, sexual power, political power. So these are some of the um, traditional and the, the, the classic uh, theories that we learned when we first took the boards, theories of aging. We talked about genetic breaks and deletions, which is a big deal, wear and tear, oxidation. And this comes from my book, The Four, Four Horses of the Apocalypse, which is oxidation, inflammation, glycation, and methylation. And these are still really important concepts. Um, but the question is this. The question is what, and I'm going to show you how this gets really complicated, but really, is there, like, what, is there some level that we can find that's sort of the master controller? And I can remember a lecture here five or 10 years ago, and somehow it just, it's, well, the light bulb went off in my head. For, you know, ever since we were kids, we were taught your DNA is everything. Your DNA controls everything. You're slave to genetics. And then someone talked about epigenetics. And suddenly I thought about, yeah, genetics doesn't control everything. Epigenetics is basically your genes, your gene pool, your, your DNA, is basically it's a blueprint. And there's no house or building that gets built by the blueprint. Someone has to act on that blueprint. So it's architect, master builders, general contractors, all the workers. So someone has to actually do something with the blueprint. So the blueprint alone, which is your DNA, is controls something. But then there is epigenetics. There's also what we call incomplete penetrance. So the first thing I tell a lot of people is we're never slave to genetics. So let's look at some therapeutic modalities. Because before we get into the advanced therapies, I want to show you these are things that I've been working on for the last 25 years. This is what's really important. We look at expectations, personal responsibility, exercise, nutritional medicine, hormonal restoration, stress reduction, brain longevity, cognitive enhancement, happiness. This is what I've been working on for the last 25 years, is a coordinated and a structured way of looking at where are you, what are your goals, what are you trying to achieve, how do we get there? And you have to lay the foundation for all these things because all of this is restorative. This is like, how do you get back to kind of where you were 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? And so these are the things that I've been working on. These are the things that I still work. This is the day-to-day -day work. Um, and again, this is kind of reiteration. This is a lot of what I do, a lot of menopause, andropause, complex lipid and cardiovascular, cognitive preservation and enhancement, stress management. This is what Steve's been working on forever. So this is kind of what we had been looking at. And this, I think all this is changing, too, because a lot of this is controversial now, which is I'm still really big on phosphatidylcholine, DMAE, Depernil, which is a dopamine agonist. Uh, phosphatidylserine, maybe paracetam, Namenda. There's a lot of controversy about whether Namenda has any effect at all. But these are some of the things we had been looking at. Can we get beyond this? Because these, are, these have been the tools that we have been working with for the last 20 years. And I still have a lot of people who do get a lot of benefit from ProVigil and uh, New Vigil. I look at these as kind of a non-speed speed because you get the effect of of uh, your brain works faster, you, you don't doze off when you're driving, and yet you don't have any of the cardiorespiratory uh, side effects from it. You don't get rapid pulse, your blood pressure doesn't go up. So these drugs, the ProVigil and NuVigil, have actually been very effective for a lot of my patients. And um, the FDA has a real weird concept about all this. The FDA's concept is, if something makes you feel better, psychedelics, new visual, anything. If anything makes you feel better, that's probably going to be a controlled substance. 
And this is how weird it gets. It was a time when my sister was developing some problem with her um, temporal lobe, and he put her on some anticonvulsant. And then I thought, well, I'll just, and she had run out, and her doc wasn't around, so I said, fine, I'll just write you a script. Then I found out it was, it was a controlled substance. It's an anticonvulsant. And the reason was they found out is because they found out in a few people that anticonvulsant made you feel better. And that's the FDA attitude. If it makes you feel better, I is maybe sort of euphoric, then uh, we got to control that. <laughs> that's actually a very Calvinistic approach is what that is. <laughs> okay. OK, so here's act two. This is where we are. That's the last 25 years. I've run through this pretty quickly. I'm showing you what the basis is. It's restorative. It's laying the groundwork, because you can't really do some of these other things without laying the groundwork. So what's, it, what's in the future here? Is, is there a possibility of developing some unitary theory, something that ties all this together? Kind of like Einstein was always looking for the, the unitary theory. He thought he had developed it. He never could quite get to that. So what are the causes, and what are the effects? Causality is an interesting phenomenon. Causality actually goes back to uh, Aristotle and even Socrates. Um, and then Hume discussed that. Um, what is causality? Because we have a problem with what is causality. What I want to know, are there master epigenetic controllers? And how do we validate these? I want to say a few words about this. I'm increasingly getting really critical of so many studies that you hear about that you're really not aware of, they're all mice studies. They're all rodent studies. And the problem is, you don't really know this. What you don't know is, most of these are what they call knockout mice. And I've never quite understood that. But my, the, my understanding is a knockout mice, really, it's kind of a synthetic, it's sort of a contrived notion. It's like, we're going to create this model. The mice doesn't really have this, but we're going to create a mouse strain, or we're going to do something to that mice so he begins to have atherosclerosis. But mice don't get atherosclerosis. So if you get a mouse and you've created this model, you've created something that actually doesn't exist in that animal. And furthermore, we're not mice. In fact, there's a difference between the way we metabolize and the way children metabolize. Children metabolize Tylenol totally different than adults do. So even within humans, you know, ages, there's a difference in metabolism. So the difference between my studies and trying to extrapolate from my studies is really a problem. And probably 90% of all the studies you hear, 90% of everything you hear is based on rodent studies. So you have to be really careful of it. I want to really caution you. Next time you hear about, oh, there was a study here that showed this and a study here that showed that. OK, so what she said, I didn't know this, OK. So I guess there's even sexism in the mice population, OK? So they're only looking at male rodents, not female rodents. I don't know. The right animal to actually test, we would never do this, really. The closest to us would be orangutans. But you know, they, we're not going to do that, OK? But I wanted to stress this fact. It's really an important fact. I'm going, to, I'm going to stress a couple of things here that are really important to stress here. So these are dogmas that everybody believes in medicine, and they're all wrong. In fact, I'm beginning to think probably 90% of everything that's done in medicine, conventional medicine, it's all wrong. It's, just, it's not challenged, and it's getting worse because it's all algorithm-driven. It's all dogma-driven. And nobody's willing to say, well, actually, do we really know that? And what if we did the opposite? It's nobody's really willing to say that. What if we did the opposite of what we're doing? What effect would that have? So the first thing is cholesterol does not cause cardiovascular disease. As my friend uh, Ron Rothenberg once said, found at the scene of the crime, not guilty. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is recruited into the process it's part of the process. It is not what initiates cardiovascular disease. And I can prove this more and more as time goes on more and more. 
So all these statins you're all taking, all these high-dose statins, it's not really taking care of the problem. Second, estrogen causes breast cancer. Not true. And th thank God, I just listened to a blog by Peter Atia, who's become real popular lately. And it was by these two people who finally validated something I had known for a long time, that the Women's Health Initiative that proved estrogen caused breast cancer, it never proved that. They even knew that. It didn't prove that. In fact, it was all political. They spent a billion dollars on this study, and it didn't prove anything. And they said, geez, um, we just spent a billion dollars. We've got to come out with something. And so they just promulgated this. And every doc believes this, that estrogen causes breast cancer. It doesn't. Testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. And now the urologic community kind of understands this now partly because now the FDA allowed men to use exogenous testosterone, so we've now come to understand that there never was any proof that testosterone caused prostate cancer. Association is not causation, really important thing. Every time you hear about something, is it just, well, it's an association, or is it really causality? It's kind of like, I mean, a silly one is probably every criminal murderer drank milk when he was a kid. Everyone. So does milk cause murder? Probably not. It doesn't cause homicide. My really important one is, and I have to stress this, because I talk about this over and over again, and I, I really see little lights going off, but it's so critical for you to understand that virtually everything you're sold, whether it's a medical uh, journal article, whether it's a car, whether it's a product, whether it's Amazon, is always using relative, not absolute statistics. And you got to understand this. Relative versus absolute statistics. So when it says, this thing was 40% better, you don't know what that means. Or we got a 15% a a reduction in this. So in the medical literature, the big thing now is you're using hazard ratios. And hazard ratios are all based on relative statistics. And it's a way of selling you product. And it's in the scientific community, it's in the commercial community, and it's everything you buy is always relative statistics. Simple thing. Something goes from, um, say, 1 to 2 in 10, that's a double. You could see that. But if something goes from 1 to 2 in a million, it's invisible. You need to understand, so much of what you hear are relative statistics. And again, it goes back to the Women's Health Initiative when they talked about we saw this value and that value. It's always based on relative statistics, not absolute statistics. Be wary of animal studies. And my last thing is what I call pharmacology 101, it's dose response. How'd they pick that dose? Every time I read a medical journal article, I, I'm always wondering, how did you pick that dose? And it is either given to them or they read the literature, but they never go out and actually ask some people who've used it, or how did you pick that dose? So the best example would be is if I did a study of um, Lipitor, and I used one milligram of Lipitor, you would get no response. If I used 100 milligrams of Lipitor, probably almost all of you would have negative response. So, so often, and it's because it's an expensive thing to do this, but so often all these experiments, all these results that you see um, ne neglect dose response. What was the right dose? What was the response to that dose? So this comes from uh, a group that's working on um, stem cell therapy. Um, it was a really interesting paper. And again, this, I'm going to show you a, a variety of pathways and see if we can kind of get down to a, a simpler pathway. But this shows here, look at growth hormone, IGF-1. And at the bottom there is mTOR and AMPK. And you've probably heard a lot about CERT-1. You may have heard a lot about AMPK. Um, and I don't know if you've heard a lot about mTOR, which I'm going to talk a lot about. mTOR is a pathway that increases and enhances um, DNA transcription 
and basically cellular division. It's like a major pathway. It's a major accelerator of cellular division and growth. And so you can see all these. And the problem is with the top there, growth hormone IGF-1, you'll see one camp that says that is a positive, another camp that says that it's a negative. But at the bottom is aging, OK? So what you look at is you, know, there you have models of the young and the models of old. And basically, in the old, what you're seeing is less ability to repair, less ability, and more damage. So what's happening is more of these damage, repair, clearance, cellular. So all of the things in the bottom there are result as, as aging. So the question is, what, what is it about this that's either not working? What's the negative and positive that's causing the difference between the young, where you have good tissue homeostasis, there's anti-cancer, probably better balance. The brakes and accelerator are better balanced. Can you read the purple boxes there to contrast? Yeah, I know. It's hard to read. So the purple box at the top says cellular senescence, and that says cellular senescence. So on the bottom, it says increased damage, less repair, less clearance, less cellular renewal, more zombie cells, which I'm going to talk about. Cellular senescence, lead blockage of cells, anti-cancer, less tissue function, more inflammation. So what we've heard about inflammaging is a big concept now. Inflammation is what's happening to our brains, what's happening to our heart, what's happening to our gut. So as we get older, all these things are working less efficiently than they were when we were younger. So here's some developing trends. This is what I'm going to get into. Mitochondria repair and support. Mitochondria are everything. Mitochondria, they think, probably goes back uh, a billion years. Somehow little bacteria just decided to come into your cells, or cells incorporated, or eukaryotic cells incorporated these bacteria, and they became an organelle. That organelle became your mitochondria. Your mitochondria is the energy factory. That's where all of your energy is manufactured. And when your mitochondria doesn't work, you're losing energy. So stem cell therapy, I always thought this was going to be big. This has been, now we've got at least 50 or 20 years experience. And I'm beginning to see where it works and where it doesn't work. And I thought this was going to be big. I still think stem cell therapy has its place. But we have to figure out why doesn't it work in some ways and it does work in other ways. There must be something that we've been missing with stem cell therapy not being the total answer. What's PRP? So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. And it turns out that platelet-rich plasma and stem cells, that they're, it's synergistic. There's a synergism between the effect that you get with that. It's a good question. I guess I shouldn't assume you know everything. Telomeres and telomerase, this is what I've been looking at. I've actually been looking at this for about 20 years. And I've become a lot more interested in this just in the last few years. I think this may be the answer. Senolytics is what's becoming a really big area. Senolytics is what do we do about senescent cells? As we're getting older, we're developing more senescent cells. Gene repair. I think this is going to be the new frontier. And I'm going to probably challenge you on this. And nanotechnology, which I, I didn't really think about was a big deal, but now I'm beginning to think nanotechnology could be a big deal in the next uh, decade. I'm going to talk to you about that. And here's what I've been thinking about. I don't know anybody's talking about this. But this is what I call the android society. I, we're, we could be looking at this. We're all doing this already. We're already doing this. You've all got one of these, OK? It's like, you know what was the name of that actress? Or what was the name of that drug? Oh, I don't know. I'll look it up, OK? We go to this immediately, because it, I can't remember, I, my wife and I, my wife and I have telepathy, so she says, I say that, yeah, you know that thing? Yeah, I know what that is. You know what that, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> and we both can't remember what it was, but we, we know what it is telepathically. <laughs> that doesn't work in the real world, this works with me and my wife. So this is a really, really interesting one. How many of you know anything about this or are interested in this? Okay, good. Let me challenge you on this, because I don't think you're going to hear this from anybody. This is really coming on because, again, NAD, NADH, what you've heard is NAD plus, 
That's what's going to really feed your mitochondria. That's the energy. This is going to be a really big energy source. And we're all losing NAD. So this is how complex it is. NAD is uh, nicotine, adenine, dinucleotide. So there's two nucleotides there with an adenine complex there. Right there, that's the adenine complex. So the dinucleotide, nucleotide, nucleotides. And then it's got a phosphate bond right here. So it's a complex molecule. And so there's NAD. See, there's a little plus right there. Okay, and here's NADH. The first thing I want you to understand is NADH is a reduced form. And the reduced form of a molecule has more energy. Because as it is oxidizing, it's giving off, it's, it's taking on electrons. It's, it's a higher energy state. The NAD plus is a lower energy state. The NADH is the higher energy state. And it used to be what everybody was interested in was Inada, which was NADH. And now we're all looking at NAD plus, and I'm going to tell you what else. So here's the mitochondria. This is really fascinating. I've been studying this like crazy for about the last two months. So the mitochondria here, it's got an inner membrane and an outer membrane. So here's the outer membrane, and here's the inner membrane. And this is called the cristae, and inside here are um, four major complexes. So it goes down what they call the electron transport chain. Okay? So this is what it looks like. So here's, here's the mitochondria. So what's happening is you have glycolysis, you got sugar, the sugar breaks down, goes to what we call the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle, and it goes eventually into the mitochondria. Oh, that's great. That works better. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. That's cool. I like that. Okay. So, um, see, here's the citric acid cycle, but here's the mitochondria. And here's what I call the electron transport system. So at first blush, this is really complicated. This is where all your energy is being manufactured. It is an amazing apparatus because it's an electron, it's a proton pump. At the very end, at the very end, there's a complex here where the ATP, it's literally a little motor. It's unbelievable. It's a little motor. It's going around like that. This little nanotech thing here, and it's spitting out. Well, phosphates are coming here, and it's spitting out ATP. So at the very end, you've got electrons going here, you got protons here, and at the very end, the ATP, which is your main energy source, that's what you're, that's what you're running on, the ATP, is spit out through this little nanomotor here. Okay? But here's the thing. Here's the cytosol. Here's ATP. There's, most of the ATP is produced produced in the mitochondria. So if you look at glycolysis, that's just breakdown of sugar. The, the initial process, what we call glycolysis, glucose, it goes through the major process here and it comes out, only produces two ATP. Krebs cycle, big cycle here, a bunch of intermediate cycles here, goes around that Krebs cycle, only produces two ATP. Goes through the mitochondria, so it goes from here to here to here. Mitochondria, 34 ATP total. So it's the mitochondria where most of your energy is being produced. Okay? And again, these are the complexes. But I want you to look at this. So here's one of the problems. One of the problems is, and you, you're not hearing, nobody's talking about this. And I actually even tried to challenge David Sinclair on this. And he said, I'm busy. Oh. Yeah. NAD and NADH does not cross the mitochondrial membrane. All the NAD and all the NAD you take is not getting into the mitochondria. So everything you're taking in, it's not getting inside your mitochondria. And I'm going to show you right here. The important thing is, uh, here's NADH to NAD. So this, I told you, is high energy and it's producing this. It starts here and goes here. This is inside the mitochondria. Where's it coming from? It has to be synthesized de novo. It's from what we call salvage pathways. It is not incorporated from anything you eat. It's not incorporated in your food. It's not in your supplements. It has to be manufactured inside 
the mitochondria. It's really difficult to do the research on this because nobody really focuses in on where is that coming from. It's manufactured de novo in the mitochondria. So it's a problem. What is all this NAD that we're taking? What is it doing? Because it's not going into your mitochondria. So the question is, here are all these complexes. And they're really important, OK? And I'm going to come back to this again. So you're going to be tested on this. <laughs> so here's complex one. And here's complex two. This is, I think this is where CoQ10 is right in here, complex two, three. And I think this one here is cytochrome oxidase C, which is like in every cell. It's really important. They're all important. And this is that nanoturbine. It's amazing. It literally is going like that, and it's spitting out ATP. Okay? But once again, inside the mitochondria, it starts with this, and it goes to this. It starts with NADH, higher energy, and it goes to NAD. Same thing with FAD. So FAD is um, riboflavin. So NAD is actually would be your vitamin, vitamin B3, niacin. And, N and FAD is riboflavin. Actually, it's what you turned your urine yellow is riboflavin. B2. B2. So again, this is electron transport system. What I want to show you is electrons here, protons here, comes out here. Now, and it goes through here, but here's the deal. And this is where the literature gets kind of confusing, but because it kind of alludes to this. But again, here's the NAD here, and here NAD. It does not cross here. The only thing that crosses is malate. That will go across that, inner, that mitochondrial membrane. NAD won't. So the question is, is this affecting this in here? Remember, this is being synthesized in here, this is out here. It does not cross. Only malate crosses, and aspartate will cross. NAD and NADH is probably affecting something else. It's not directly being incorporated into those important aspects of your mitochondrial transport. And again, this shows you energy flow. You see? It's coming down here. This is energy flow. So, Again, this is, the, this is the, the end point here. The end point is you're developing 36 ATP. So it's a really important concept. You know, what are we going to do? Because now, um, uh-oh, what do we do here? I always press the wrong button at some point. So here's NAD. So NAD is, is participating in some other processes. It's a participating, it's interacting with your sirtuins, it's doing some other things. I think what's happening is this, and I, I can't be sure about it. Steve will probably interject something here. But I think what's happening is this other process that's always really intrigued me. It's called cell signaling processing. So what's happening is in the mitochondria, there's mitochondrial DNA, and that mitochondrial DNA is all maternal all from your mother. So your energy, in some ways, is all determined by how energetic your mother was, not your father. Because the mitochondrial DNA, and the mitochondrial DNA only has 13 codons, and it's primarily responsible for repairing these, keep these vigorous, repairing these, OK? So um, I think what it's doing, and then there's a, then the, what's called the nuclear DNA. And there's an interplay, so the mitochondrial DNA repairs the mitochondria. The, the nuclear DNA is doing everything else. I think what NAD is doing is somehow it's signaling the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA to do their job. There's some other cell signaling things that are going on besides just what I showed you is going on inside the mitochondria. Let's go on. So let's talk about mTOR pathways, MPK, rapamycin, physidin, desinatinib. And I'm not going to talk about all these because I don't have time. This really would be a two-hour lecture. So let me talk to you about rapamycin because I've been personally experimenting with this. This one's an easy one, and it's an interesting one. And the idea is that I'm going to show you. See, this is what I mean by how complex it is. And so when you hear about something, you say, oh, just take this. It does this. But then you go to the literature and it says, look at all this. And I do this just to show you that it can get that complex. Can we get it simpler? Can we get it down to there? A little simpler. At that point, now we're kind of drilling down. So this is what we call, um, so the mTOR, again, I told you mTOR is an accelerator. mTOR is acting on our nuclear DNA. mTOR is, is controlling transcription, 
protein synthesis is, 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 is a really major pathway. But what happens as we get older, one of the theories I'm going to show you really quickly is that maybe we're going a little too fast as we get older. So the mTOR has a mTOR1 and mTOR2. mTOR1 is the good pathway, mTOR2 you don't want to mess with. So one is a good pathway, one's another that you don't want to mess with. And so like here, okay. So this gets a little simpler, okay. Simpler, so mTOR1, protein synthesis, autophagy, getting rid of bad cells. mTOR2, cell survival, cell polarity. You don't want to mess with this pathway. So you want this pathway, you don't want to mess with this. Okay, and I think the, the point is, what we're looking at is rapamycin is an immunosuppressant. And the idea is that it's kind of slowing down this. So this is a theory that Blagospani is a sort of Russian uh, uh, investigator. And this is his theory. His theory is that as we get older, what's happening is, is our processes are going too fast. I showed you the mitochondria. I showed you all those electrons. I showed you all those protons. But what happens as we get older, because of age and because of repair, all those electrons are starting to affect all the membranes. So the theory is as we get older, our repair processes are not as good, and so all these, we want to kind of slow this process down a little bit. So his theory is everything's going in hyperspace. So when we were 20, we could race that car, 20, you know, 100 miles an hour. When we were 90, when we were 80, well, maybe we don't want to drive quite as fast. <laughs> I remember driving my TR4 at 140 miles an hour in Mexico. I wouldn't do that today. Um, so this is interesting. So that's the idea. And rapamycin, the idea of rapamycin is it slows this process down. It's slowing it down. So we talk about senolytics. People are talking about senolytics getting rid of dead cells that are not doing anything, what we call zombie cells. Or we could just decrease the rate of developing those dead cells. So when people are talking about senolytics, and you're going to read about this, senolytics is, not, is the question is, are you really getting rid of the dead cells or are you decreasing the rate at which those dead cells are accumulating? And that's what I think rapamycin does. So I've been experimenting with rapamycin, a very low dose, once a week. And I think what I'm going to do is cycle this on every quarter. You want to do just a little bit. You want to take the garden, thin out the weeds very carefully, let the flowers grow, thin out the garden, give it a rest. So this is what I think is the big deal. So I just told you, senolytics is a way as we slow down that process, we get rid of the we get rid of these senescent cells, what we call zombie cells, or we can go the other way. And the other way, can we actually reinvigorate our cells? So telom telomeres, this has been around. So the, the really important researchers, interestingly, have all been women. Carol Kreider, Elizabeth Blackburn, Marie Blasco, and then the, a lot of work was done with Calvin Harley and his group with. Giron Corporation, and he spoke to us like, remember him speaking to us like 15 years ago? It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't Calvin Harley, it was Michael, was the CEO at that one time. It wasn't Bill Andrews? It wasn't Bill Andrews, no, it was someone else. Um, so Giron had been developing the work with telomerase. Telomerase is not expressed normally, but when you do express it, what's happening is this. As we get older, here's our chromosomes. So here we go, cell division, cell division, so okay. So there's a thing called the Hayflick limit, which I've never really quite understood. Hayflick limit says, you know, after 50 cell divisions, it doesn't work anymore. You stop. And then we can figure out if we have like billions of cells, what did it matter whether one cell only divided 50 times? But this is a concept of cells can only divide a certain number of times. And it turns out the reason why there's that limit is telomeres. So telomeres are like these little end caps here, these little end caps. And what happens as we get older here, these are the telomeres. And at the, as we get older, those telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And at a certain point, when we get too short, cell stops dividing. There's something about they're frayed, and when they get to a certain length, cell stops dividing. Telomerase is not turned on. So the interesting biological concept is why is that not turned on? It's turned on in cancer cells. But it's not turned on all cancer cells. It's turned on in all your germ cells, testicles, ovaries. Germ cell line is immortal. We're passing the seed from generation to generation. It's an immortal line. 
somatic cells, which is what we are, is, is mortal. So this is the trick, and this is what Bill Andrews had been talking about. Bill Andrews had been talking about, actually, there's kind of a repressor, and the repressor says, don't turn on telomerase. What, how can we affect with telomerase inducers to turn off that repressor and activate telomerase? And that's where uh, TA65, I don't know if you've heard of TA65, and TA65, actually, Noel Patton bought that patent from Giron, and he developed the product TA65. Bill Andrews has another product. I think we're going to see more and stronger telomerase activators. Telomerase, I think, is the key. That's my personal opinion right now. And the person who's really working on this heavy duty is Bill Andrews in Sierra Sciences and uh, Michael Fossil with Telocyte. Can you explain what telomerase does just to make sure? We... So telomerase, it's interesting. What does it do? Basically, it's kind of a weird concept. What is telomerase? To me, telomerase, when, every time I hear that, it sounds like something's being cut out. But it's actually telomerase is it's turning on the ability to re-lengthen or to stop the shortening of your telomeres. So what you're trying to do is telomerase is normally not on. And if it's not on, that means the rate of telomere shortening is shorter and shorter and shorter. If we can turn on telomeres, then that rate of shortening stops, and maybe we can begin to increase the length of telomeres. If you increase the tel length of telomeres, cell division continues, you have rejuvenation. Does that make sense? Okay. So this, is, this comes from Michael Fossil, which is, and again, cause and effect. What is the cause? What's the effect? And the way he looks at it is here, it's telomerase theory, it's analytics, symptomatic drugs. In other, this is where we're all concentrating on. The question is, what's going on here? Is this the epigenetic controller? Okay? And so his theory is if you do senolytics, because I talked to, if you talk to the guys in the telomere community, like Michael Fossil, Bill Andrews, and you talk to them about senolytics, that's not their favorite topic. Because their idea is if you really do this too vigorously, actually what you have is if you get rid of too many dead cells, then you increase your normal cells to turn over quicker. If they turn over quicker, then maybe you're going to deplete those. So the question is, what's that balance? And nobody knows that. What is that balance? So that's what we're looking for. So this, this is going to answer your question more. Michael Fossil says, if you do senolytics too vigorously, what happens is you get a little bump, better, but then it gets worse. You get a little bump, gets better, but then you actually increase the rate of cellular turnover. Now we go back to that blog of Spani, which is, are we in hyper speed? Okay. So the meta view is this. This is, seems simple, but it's like everything to me, which is this. Here's our telomeres when we're younger. And at a certain age right here, that is the critical point. And I, and I, I asked Michael about it. He wouldn't commit to it. I think it's about... 60. It could be 55, it could be 60, 65. Give or take, it's about 60 years of age. That's the critical point at which you begin to develop genomic instability. Genomic instability is, can you repair your genes? Are your genes as active and as vigorous as they were? And they can go one of a couple of ways. They can go this way, which is cells then become senescent and they become what we call zombie cells, which put out inflammatory zytokines. Or they can become really insta instable and become cancerous cells. Or telomerase <coughs> inducers, what if we go back up again? So we can go back up again, we go here. And I think, and I've had this argument with people, that the balance here is P53 and telomerase. P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. It's the brakes. Telomerase is the accelerator. And the question is, what is the balance between P53? Almost all tumors, the thing I want to know is what's your P53? Because almost always the P53 is mutated when you have cancer. P53 is the brakes. Cancer is because you have not developed the ability to stop the division or the, the, this, you've not been able to stop this process here. <coughs> Healthy P53 suppresses tumors. 
the question is, what's going on right here? Do we go this way, do we go this way, or go that way? That is the challenge that we face right now. That's the challenge we're going to face in the next five to 10 years, is which way are we going to go? Are we going to concentrate on senolytics? Are we going to concentrate on telomerase and rejuvenating cells? Or are we going to just keep hammering on this pathway? What do we do about cancer? So the, the question is, how does genetic predisposition? So, um, For certain cancers. Yeah. So, again, remember what I said about half an hour ago. You're never slave to your genetics. So you may have a predisposition. You may have a familial pattern. You may have a genetic pattern. But it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get it. The best example is, if you do an apple Eve an apple E, so apple, if you have an apple E4, E4, so homozygous, apple E4 and apple E4, theoretically have a 90% chance of developing Alzheimer's. But it actually doesn't mean you're going to develop Alzheimer's because there's other nutritional factors, there's other psychological factors, there's a lifestyle, how is that gonna affect? So we have this thing called genetic um, predisposition or incomplete penetrance. So you have a genetic predisposition, and it doesn't really express itself until you're like 45, or 48, or 50. So some of this is genetic predisposition. The, the nomogram that I use with a lot of people is there's a, there's a four square thing. There's one, people who have great genetics, and they make them better. Those people never see me. <laughs> you can have great genetics and make them worse. You can have bad genetics and make it better. Those are the people who see me. Or you can have bad genetics and make them worse. Those people are kind of suicidal. Bad genetics and make it worse. So you never slave to your genetics. You can always modify it. And the, like I said, I think genetic engineering is going to be a really big deal because that's how we're going to do telomerase. It's going to be through genetic engineering. We don't have the microphone, so you'll have to repeat the question. Okay. Sure. So let me just... Let me finish up with this here. Hold your sure, question just for I'll one second, it. okay? So, um, Ray Kurzweil talks about the singularity. Singularity is when we fuse with machines or we go escape velocity. We can actually become immortal forever. Is that a dream? Is it not a dream? What are we doing in the meantime before that happens? We only got maybe 10 years, 15 years. What are we doing in the meantime? The workless society. I think this is a big deal. This is what Chang is, Yang is talking about, the workless society, because we're at, the, we're at the third point in human evolution. First one was slaves. Second was industrial revolution. We're now at the point where everything's robots. Deep learning and chip implantation, which I think is really going to be amazing. So here's chip implantation. Okay. And I did have a picture here that doesn't show up. Here are the books that I want you to read. I want you to read this Telomerous Revolution by Michael Fossil. The End of Alzheimer's is really an interesting book. OK, we should read The Telomerous Revolution, Michael Fossil. Michael Fossil is a physician and an investigator. Um, I had a really good talk with Michael. I, I have an immense amount of respect for what he's trying to do. End of Alzheimer's, I think you've all heard about Del Bredesen. Okay. And I know he's spoken here. I will tell you, uh, I think the thing that, that the, the, the take home message with Del Bredesen is what he's trying to do and what he's sort of succeeding to do is he's trying to make functional medicine acceptable. That's really what he's doing, making functional medicine acceptable. Because he's bridging that gap between all the researchers and the community with the Buck Institute, I think that's his main thing. Beyond the Alzheimer's, what he's doing is saying, this is a functional medicine. Because to be honest, I'm already doing 90% of what he's talking about. I've been doing that for the last 20 years. I want you to read this. This one just came out. I actually haven't read this one. Everybody's thinking this is going to be a great book. And David Sinclair is the one who was promoting resveratrol. He's a great researcher. I also think he's an amazing marketer great marketer. Okay? This one here, I really want all women to read this. Estrogen does not cause breast cancer. And this is the whole thing about how this is all fabricated. This whole notion was 
completely fabricated. And then I want you to read my book. <laughs> so remember, truth passes through three, three stages. It's still a great book. <laughs> it's still a great book. And you'll get a lot out of this book. Uh, Schopenhauer, 19th century. First it's ridiculed. Then it's violently opposed. And then it's like accepted. Oh, yeah, we always knew that. <laughs> and it's always that way. And it will always be that way. The corollary of that is. Uh, you know, science advances one funeral at a time. So this is me. This is how you find me. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I've sort of piqued your curiosity. Um, I'm always here to kind of puncture a few balloons and tell you things are not quite what you've heard, get you to think a little bit about each of these concepts. All right, great. So we have you. time for questions. So right Thank you. I've heard a little. I've heard a bit about carbon sixty interacting with senescent cells in some very beneficial way, yeah. and the claim is that I can't verify is that when you have carbon sixty, the senescent cells recognize they're close to their. They, they can't reproduce. So it actually it causes them to undergo apoptosis, mm -hmm. which releases all of the nutrients to the stem cells and actually stimulates stem cells of that same kind. Mm -hmm. So if a person measured their telomere length when they're 60, three years later after taking carbon 60, their telomere length would average 25 or 40, you know, many, many years younger. Mm -hmm. And not, I never heard why how that mechanism works. Have you heard anything about that or heard about carbon-60 at all? So, so uh, as I recall, carbon is eight. So how do you get, how do you? Carbon-60 is a buckyball discovered in 1983, okay. Nobel Prize 1993. Okay. It's a neutral carbon atom. There's nothing hanging on there yeah. except carbon. It's 60 carbon atoms. So, okay, but remember, you know, carbon is, is I think is eight, right? Carbon, okay. th that's so, molecule. This is molecule. Yeah. Atoms of carbon okay. in a molecule. I don't know about this one. It's kind of interesting. But you c we're going to hear about a lot of different ways of doing this. The whole concept of apoptosis, autophagy, senolytics, it's all related. What I've tried to show you is there's different theories about this, different ways of approaching this. And we don't know the final answer. But it's what you're going to be hearing more and more about. And it's an incredible subject. So I don't know about this sex this exact one. You should look it up. Okay. Please okay. Okay. Hi. Um, you were saying things like, okay, so not NAD or whatever. Well, then what, what are we supposed to take? Like you talked about a lot of stuff, but like right. what do we do right now? <laughs> well, I showed you. Yeah, come on. I showed you all the things that I do in terms of nutrition, in terms of hormones. Okay. So um, if you ask me what do I take personally, what should you be taking? Right. Everything. So, <laughs> so what's, your, what's your favorite then? What to, like, because I mean, you, you, you said some things didn't work. Okay, what, what, has the biggest so, Im, what has the biggest impact on the telomeres on what you can take? Oh, I mean, I know, li well, forget so, lifestyle stuff, because we all know how to do what that is. So, you have to, that, so the answer is, the question has to be focused. I mean, if you want to know what I take, if I tell people what I take, they said, well, that's kind of a lot. I don't want to be doing that. So if you want to know specifically about the NAD, the question with NAD is, is it, NAD plus, is it NMN, is it NR? So NR is, nu is a nicotinamide riboside, NMN is nicotinamide mononucleoside, or is it niogen, which is, I think, nicotinamide riboside? Um, so the question, and, and the NAD, some people are getting NAD, pa NAD plus patches, uh, infusion. So everybody seems to be gravitating toward NR is the one you want to be taking. I'm just showing you whatever it is, whether it's NR, NMN, everybody has their idea of the best, best one to take, the, the, the best one. I'm just telling you, it's not getting into your mitochondria. It's doing something else. So, it's something else positive, but not Yes, it's doing something else positive. 
Nobody's telling you exactly what that is. Take the microphone, please. What's your single favorite thing to elongate telomeres? Okay. So that's the question, telomeres? Okay. So to elongate telomeres, for the longest period of time, what we had was TH65. What's your favorite thing? The one that I think is probably the strongest is the one that Bill Andrews is working on, which used to be called TAM818, T-A-M818, but then he renamed it recently. I think he named it aging pills or something like that. So if you go to, I think it's Defy Age, I have to look it up you'll find Bill Andrews. So if you just Google Bill Andrews, it'll take you to his site. He's got probably the best, it, it used to be called TAM818, probably much stronger. Now, this is a very contentious field, and really, people don't even like to talk about this in public because everybody's kind of fighting each other. But if you want to know the truth, just between you and I and everybody else who's listening to this, the, probably the TAM18 is probably going to be the strongest. None of these are inexpensive. They're all expensive. But that's probably the strongest one that's out there right now. Is it TAM? TAM 818. Okay. But like I said, he, he renamed it to something else. So we, uh, I'll the capsules. The capsules. Aging yeah. That's an aging care capsules. That's so it. This is your favorite single thing to impact the length of your telomeres. Yes. Second yes. <laughs> second favorite one? Yeah. Stress reduction. Oh, come on. Let's no, go on. Also, I mean, we, these are things we're doing already. Okay. Yeah. So we got a lot of questions here. So what you can do is you can, uh, well, you got stress reduction. So uh, there will be a little moment at the break. You can go talk to Dr. Miller, too, I think. So I want to take one. I know we have a lot of hands up. So let me take one more question here, and then I'll come over to that side of the room, okay? So and try to make your questions quick and. You want to say something about fasting? So um, this is a great subject, and everybody's got their idea about it. So. Um, you know, Roy Walford was doing this thing with caloric restriction. Everybody's into caloric restriction. I've had guys, I actually had one guy that I saw 20 years ago, just came back to me this last week. He had been doing caloric restriction, which is like literally weighing every morsel of food. Luckily, people have kind of gotten away from it because it's too much. So what we're looking at now is what is fasting? So is fasting, well, it's every quarter. Is fasting every other day? Is it fasting every day? So, so the thing that I think works the best is this, because we, we I, you know, everybody's going to have their own tolerances, because we can do it, it can't do it. I think the best thing is this. I used to be really big on a morning breakfast, okay? But it turns out a 16-hour fast probably is, is the best way of getting that fasting that's reasonable. You're not going to be hungry. You're not going to overdo it. 16-hour fast means, you know, 8 o'clock at night, you don't eat until about you know, noon or 1 o'clock the next day. And everybody can kind of do that. So instead of eating your breakfast at 8 o'clock, eat your breakfast at 12. 16-hour fast probably is the best. I know people are doing it every other day. I know people are doing it for a week. I think all these are difficult. But 16-hour fast seems to be one that's most practical for most people. That uh, lengthens your telomeres, right? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, Yes, Bermadine, so how is it uh, similar or different to um, rapamycin? At, at which? Spermidine. I just came across that um, I'm, lately. I'm so spermidine is another molecule that's supposed to be similar uh, than uh, rapamycin. Do you know anything about N that? No, but I don't think that rapamycin is going to be the end drug. I think we're going to have other ones that are going to be similar to that. Rapamycin, I think, comes from, I think, Easter Island. It, it was, you know, as a lot of drugs came from plant source to begin with. Um, I think we're going to have other ones similar to that. But again, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. So it's kind of like the model. I'm sure we'll have others that come beyond that. Um, on your picture uh, where B53 was in the middle, yes. there was a MDM2. Yes. What is that? MDM2? It was right in the center of that picture. Uh, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> It was another, the MDM2 is another one of these major pathways, and I have to review that again, but it was another, that was, you, you looked at that, that's very good. 
get an A for that, they picked that up. It was another one of these major controller pathways. Okay. 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 Yeah, oh, there's a ma there another major controller pathway. Okay. What's the difference between TA65 and astragalus? So, um, again, there's a lot of contentiousness in there. TA65, the whole thing about it was it's cycloestragenol. So you have astragalus, which I use a lot. Astragalus is really great. You know, in the first time you, the first sign of a flu or any viral syndrome, you take 1,000 milligrams of astragalus. It's a great molecule. It's called the kingly herb, Chinese herb. But cycloestragenol is sort of a, a, is a reorganization of astragalus. So it's just, it's just a, it's a modification that A, you can patent, and B, was stronger than just straight astragalus. Okay. Okay. Um, there's, oh, one more back here. Okay. So far, you're the only one who stumped me, okay. Do you like the idea of testing your telomere length, particularly if you're going to be on a program to try to increase it over time? Yeah, but with, with caveats. And the caveat is, um, nobody really knows if we really got the right methodology now. There's a company that started up here in the Silicon Valley that's doing some work. The major lab is the lab um, uh, Life Length, uh, which is out of Marie Blasco's lab in Madrid. And that's the one that's the best. Organizationally, they're a little difficult, but in terms of the science, they're the best. The question is, what are we measuring? Is it white blood cells? Is it musobuckle cells? And, and are we looking at the average cell? What you really want to know is a couple of things. What is the percentage of short telomeres? And actually, what you want to see is kind of a progression over time, how quickly your telomeres are shortening. So it's more than just a slice in time. Like every lab that I do, every, I can do $10,000 worth of lab work on you today, but that's today. If I see my spreadsheet where I've got the next 10 years, I have a much better idea what's going on. So it's going to be actually look at longitudinal shortening the, you know, the, the, the time constant there. That's going to be more important. So, so you should do it as a baseline, but realize that there's limitations. It, it's a very difficult problem measuring aging, right? Because you're talking about processes that are changing maybe 1% a year, and the accuracy of our measurements are probably not even that good, right? So it's, it's a big problem that still has to be solved. But if you take lots of measurements, maybe over time you can sort of get an average, like it says. Anyway, okay, one more. Let's have this. Um, all right, maybe two more. Two more. Yeah, we'll take a break really soon here. All right. If I understand TA65 right, it, it, it's just nutrients, right? It's just a pill made of food, or is it more complex with that with any uh, biotech engineering or anything? Well, it's cycloestragenol, so it's a stragulus that's been modified. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modification of astragalus. So that was, it was developed by biotech, by the Giron Corporation. Yeah. Um, but that's not just a der derived out so of So it's food. not just the same as astrag astragalus. So it's not just food. It's something that's been modified. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's a okay. you know, biotech product. One more here. And then when we, uh, when we take a break, I think, okay. Dr. Miller, be, you'll be available to talk to people, uh, hopefully. A little bit. All right. Good so, questions. Right. You're, you're awake. I also saw one of you nodding off. So I'm trying to understand a little more of this NAD issue of yes. it doesn't cross the mitochondrial barrier. So yeah. it looked like in your um, presentation that we produce NAD outside the membrane and inside the membrane. Correct. Correct? Yes. So, yes. Uh, does it, so it's still having its effects in both inside and outside, yeah, right? Yeah, no, clearly. Right. And what I showed you with the electron transport system, the oxidative phosphorylation is NAD and FAD is critical. But I just wanted to let you know, and trying to teach you, nobody else is talking about this, that when you take this, it's not getting into your mitochondria, which is where most of the work is being done. There are other things that are going outside the mitochondria. So it, it, there are other things like sirtuins and everything else. So these precursors also do not cross the mitochondrial mem membrane? Probably not. So the, inside the mitochondria, it's producing NAD through some other mechanism. It's called, what we, it's called salvage pathways. It's, it's de novo. It's producing it, it by itself. Inside, there's a process but where it's But it's got to be producing it from something. 
And yeah. what is it producing it from? You know, that's a great question. <laughs> because I have Googled this, and it's called salvage pathways. And actually, Steve might know this, but there are ways of, um, I have to look at this again. There are precursors. I can't remember what this tryptophan. There's I some precursors niacin, of that. I thought niacin was a precursor, yeah. and niacinamide. Yeah, but right. They're, but they're it's all. But it's like you got to understand. It's it's in there. You're not shoving it in there. Your mitochondria is making that inside there. Yeah. So your your body can make it from niacin and from tryptophan. And niacin is the preferred pathway. Tryptophan is the is the. I think it's like you get like two percent out of that pathway. It's real. The both of them really um, suck in terms of efficiency, but. The issue is that when you look at reducing equivalents and, and the way in which NADH regenerates and all, um, it's obvious that it, there's no tryptophan or no NAD or NADH exchange across the membranes. Everything is rigidly compartmented. But it doesn't mean that there's nothing that gets through the membrane. It just isn't the, 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 the compartmentalization is like 99% as good as the scientists can discover. But some of it may actually get in but it's a very, very small amount. The, there's a one product, I, I know I'm going over time because I know this will be long. There's a product called Benagene, which I've really been big on. And Benagene is oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate is related to malic acid. If you remember this diagram, malic acid does go across. So the biochemistry is pretty complex. I just wanted to get this point across that you're taking NAD and AMN and R, whatever it is, it's not getting into the mitochondria where you think it's getting into. It's being generated by itself. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Miller. Please thank give you. Dr. Miller.